Okay. Hello, Susan. So glad you could join us back. We are waiting two more minutes. A lot of people joining in. Może jednak powinnam przygotować na taki wariant. All right. <laughs> All right. Some people are still joining in, a lot of them, so that's why we're making it well. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so for those of you who are here for the first time, my name is uh, Magda Karzyńska Wojcik, and uh, I wrote, I'm, I'm affiliated with the um, Nanovic Institute for European Studies and the University of Notre Dame at the University of Notre Dame and John Paul II Catholic University of uh, Lublin. And next to me on the screen, you can see uh, Monika Opalinska, who is. Uh, um, from the University of Warsaw, and we're jointly responsible for the series, in the preparation of which we are assisted by the incredible team of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And we are very grateful for this support. Thank you. This is the third meeting in our series of nine, um, as you can see. And today we're going to learn about Augustine's Narraciones in Psalmos from Professor Hildegund Miller. Hildegund Miller, more generally known to all of us as Gundi, is an associate professor in the Department of Classics and a fellow of the Medieval Institute at the University, University of Notre Dame. Unbelievably, she combines these responsibilities with that of a senior liaison for research and curricular affairs at the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Gundi's university education centered on philology, classical and German, and she is associated, and that education was associated with the University of Vienna, where she received her PhD in classical philology. She has worked at universities, research and educational institutions on both sides of the Atlantic in Germany, Austria, Slovakia, and the US. Professor Müller is the past recipient of several scholarship and is frequently invited as a guest lecturer to universities in many parts of the world. Gundi specializes in the Latin literature of late antiquity, both poetry and prose, and here her focus is on patristic literature. Gundi has expert knowledge in several branches within that broad area. First of all, there is the late ancient rhetoric, its orality and performative aspects, as well as the stylistic features of late ancient prose. Gundi's focus is on the homiletic works of Augustine of Hippo, which is where we meet the Psalms. Her interests in Augustine's work cover widely different aspects, such as their relation to classical rhetoric, in particular adaptation of classical models and generic innovations in late antiquity, um, the use of biblical and other sources, and as I've already said, the way these are shaped by, these works are shaped by improvisation and orality, the performative aspect. Professor Miller is, also interested in the editorial technique, and she has edited 
among other texts, two volumes of editions of Augustine's Psalm Commentary, in particular, Psalms 51 to 60 and 61 to 70. And that is a project which she first got involved in when she was a student. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Gunti also prepared various other editions of patristic and medieval texts. She is also the author of several articles on late antique sermon collections and also on poetry from the 11th and 12th centuries. Her publications focus on close reading, literary interpretation and textual criticism. And Gundi is currently working on a book on Augustine as a preacher, looking into matters such as how he developed his specific concepts and style of preaching, against the background of late antique culture, in particular, his own training as a rhetorician on the one hand, and liturgy and church practice on the other. I think Gunther's research style is best summarized by the short line she sent me in our email exchange concerning today's talk. In particular, Gundi asked me how much time she had for the lecture. And when I suggested something around 45 minutes, Gundi replied, oh, I can talk about a narraciones for five hours straight, but promised to try to squeeze it in three quarters of an hour. Well, I can confirm that passion for Augustine because I had the privilege of discussing research issues um, with Gundi, and we found ourselves caught up in a heated discussion at midnight. The cats, Gundi's cats, were appalled by what we were doing, and that made us call it a day. So in a moment, we're going to listen to Gundi talking about narraciones in a very Augustine-like sort of way involving both spontaneity, which Augustine strongly believed in as a preacher, and rigid scholarly discipline, which reflects decades of learning fueled by passion and dedication. Gundi, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this very, very nice introduction. Um, this is our lies, obviously, but it, I still enjoyed it, I must say. Um, I am... Um, presenting you uh, with a with a somewhat general title and a somewhat general um, uh, lecture on on Augustine's Generationes. I I'm, I'm always apologizing before I give a lecture so this is my my obligatory um, uh, apology I hope that you will find something in it that you have not heard many times before and I think very much um, that that Augustine is, um, if you, I'm, I'm getting into it, sorry about that. Um, I, if you think of Augustine's Inerationes in Psalmos, most of you probably think of it as a finished book, as a work, as a thing that is stable. Um, what I do, coming from where I am, is I think of Augustine's work as something that is very much a work in progress, that he had to be invented, every single step had to be invented, and Enerationis in Salmos is a very, very important step on his road to becoming who we think of when we think of Augustine. Um, so I, I'm happy to in, engage in any very detailed questions afterwards, but this is not going to be extremely detailed. I will try, as I said, to talk for 45 minutes and not more. Uh, I am going to find my screen and share it with you. Can you all see my screen? Is that okay? okay. Yes, it is. Very good. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the, I'm, I'm in a way, I'm happy that the title of the whole thing is so general, um, which is, of course, because I forgot to, uh, I, I omitted to give a precise title on time. So the title is thanks to Magda and Monica. Thank you for that and many other things. Um, and the only adjustment to the title that I'm making is that I am changing it to Augustine's so-called Generationes in Psalmos, because as you know, and as we all know, the book was not called Generationes in Psalmos, and as I will argue in a moment, it was not called anything at all. Um, here's more or less of an overview. The first question is what is or what are Generationes in Psalmos, and there is and are is not just a question of how you, what the, what the correct verb is in correct American English, going with a title like Generationes, um, but also is it one, is it many? 
then I will, I guess I have to, because it's not all that well known. I have to tell you a little bit about how this book came together, came to be a unit, a thing, a book, so to speak. And there are good reasons for doing that. I will explain that. Um, and coming from the, con uh, the composition, I will talk a little bit about the context of its composition. So what does it mean? Where, where was it, in which environment was it created, in which cultural, in which political environment, um, in which biographical environment for Augustine? So what does that mean for the book and which specific challenges does it respond to, did it respond to when it wasn't yet a book? I thought that at this point I would talk a little bit about the sound text because it was um, not only because this is what the title of the lecture series sort of implies that I not just talk about Augustine, that I talk about his sound text. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about his sound text, which also has to do, as you will see, with his exegesis. It's not just a question of which specific kind of old Latin text, which is an interesting question, but I'm also going to tell you about what the, the kind in which he uses this psalm um, text tells us about him as a preacher. And then I'll do a thing, and these two points are really one point that came together in my final um, presentation, in my final uh, layout, um, about what does he do? I mean, what exactly is reading the Psalms for Augustine? And here, of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's at the very end of the, of the discussion, and it's the thing that should take hours and hours, this is the thing that I really, really should talk about, and I will only scratch the surface for that. Um, I did mean to talk a little bit about what happens afterwards, but I guess that this is not going to work. This is not going to fit into my time, time frame. So let's just say that, um, let's, let's just talk about the Nagleben in any way that you want afterwards. Um, I hope that this so far is clear, and let me just start out by the question of what is or are Enerationes in Psalmos. As you will see, I sort of indulged myself with artwork this time, I, just because I, I like art as well as I like Augustine. And this is a, a picture that I found um, that is, is uh, from, from about 1300 that shows, I think, a really interesting, quite barber looking for me, Augustine, that also has a kind of skeptical questioning eye, uh, look in his eye that is partly um, owed to the fact that he is on the very left frame of a uh, Saka Conversatione of a picture with, of the, so he's looking towards the Virgin Mary, of course. But I still think that that is a rather remarkable picture of Augustine, and he will accompany us, it will accompany us for the first chapter, so to speak, of this presentation. So, what is or are Enerationism Psalms? Augustine is the author of the first complete psalm commentary that we have that is that is preserved completely and the first complete psalm commentary that was written to our knowledge in latin there is a little bit as one greek original full psalm commentary before that we don't have everything of um, which is uh, eusebius of caesarea and then we have parts of the site uh, interpreted by origin, two series of interpretations by origin, Hilary of Poitiers, and Ambrose in Latin, and all of these people were completely overwhelmed by the idea of interpreting 150 Psalms. The Salta is a very, very long book, if you take it as one book, and, and did not finish whatever they did. Um, in all of these cases, we probably, be, probably have a kind of sermon-like structure to it, where one sermon is one explanation of one psalm. Um, so, it, I mean, one of the questions that we can ask ourselves is, why does he do that? Why does he do something that is so massive? I mean, this is the longest book that he wrote, if you regard it as a book that he wrote, which is, I mean, the question is, is this a book? Did he write it? All of these things are questions, but as an outcome, as a volume, it's the longest of everything he did. So why on earth did he go that path? Um, the, the book is, is interesting in that it consists of separate explanations that are not all of them the same, that don't all of them look the same. Some of them are clearly preached. Some of them are clearly dictated. That seems to be the main difference. Some of them connect together. Some of them are entirely separate. So we will talk about all of that in a moment. Um, so is this a book? 
Is this a work or is this a collection? So the one thing that I can absolutely say about Nachleben in this case is that it changes, that the genre of the book changes. And that is one thing that I find interesting about late ancient genres, that they are not stable. Uh, in, in classical literature, a tragedy is a tragedy. In patristic literature, something that was originally a sermon becomes a chapter of a commentary and the chapter of the commentary may then be reused and become a sermon again, and you can spin that out. And Augustine is very much part of this process of, of um, repeated relieu of a text. Um, the title. The title is, as I said, not by Augustine. The first written knowledge that we have of the title is that Erasmus uses it in his edition of Augustine. He calls the book a narrationes im Salmos. And I would like to point out for everybody here, whoever uses the title, that it's spelled e narrationes, E-N and then two R's. Even classicists don't know that. E narrare means to, means to comment on some, something, to explain something. And e narrationes is a title that is rarely found. And in this case, is fully made up by Erasmus. So what was it called? What did Augustine call it? He didn't, obviously. When he talks about it, he will talk about it in verbal forms, such as. And these passages are important because we will return to them. Um, I dictated an explanation of three psalms in long books, non parvis volumnibus, and then he gives us numbers of the three psalms, um, 67, 71, 77. Or in another place, he says, I had explained all the psalms that we call the Psalter, and this is paraphrased a little bit, partly by talking in public, partly by dictating with the help of the Lord as I could. Um, so you see, that is what he talks about. He talks about the act of doing that, but he never says, my book, so and so. Um, in his work list, the Retractationes, commentaries are not mentioned and therefore, uh, uh, sorry, sermons are not mentioned and therefore in Rationes, considered to be a bunch of sermons, does not show up. Here is then an early reader, the probably earliest well, yeah, the, the, the earliest person who reads in Rationis and talks about it, and he talks about it in very, very negative terms. This is Jerome in the infamous exchange of, of letters with Augustine, where they are fighting on the explanation of Galatians and on how one should translate or whether one should translate the Bible. And he says, I've never read your books, so I cannot say anything about your books because they are not, we don't have them here in Bethlehem. Preter soliloquiorum tuorum libros, except for your soliloquia, your soliloquies, et quos dam commentariolos in psalmos, some little commentaries on the Psalms. And if I wanted to talk about those, I would say that they differ, not from my opinion, but from the opinion of all the Greek old fathers. So Jerome makes it very clear that either he hasn't read Augustine, or if he has read him, he doesn't approve of him. Um, interestingly, he calls this book Commentariolos in Psalmos. Is this sort of a negative word about what he is reading? Does it mean that what he is reading is in small form and that can be different things? We would like to know what he calls, what he actually had when he read Quostam Commentariolos, but we don't know that. Um, and one last um, uh, witness, early witness, and that's a passage that we will definitely come back to. This is in one of Augustine's work lists, the so-called Indiculum, that is linked with the name of his uh, biographer Presidius, but was probably not put together by him. That's a work list by, by somebody. Um, it could also be that it's not a work list, that it's a, a library catalog. And here's what we get. We get a long and complicated explanation of the whole work, and it shows this, this varied, different nature. So there are the exposed, the, 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 yeah, we don't really know, the, the, a commentary on the Psalms from 1 through 33. And then some of those were in popolo tractati, were sermons, and we get a series of numbers. This is a textual problem that I'm not going to talk about. Others were dictated, and you get a series of numbers. Again, others, with the exception of number 118, were preached, and those are 79. So in, in full, there are 123 sermons, because one of them was preached twice. 
nobody understands what that means. If you if you try to um, put that uh, in 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 uh, sync with the with the actual sermons, some of it is true. Some of the numbers are just idiotic. We don't know how it exactly works. But what I want to tell you is at this point, and I'm not going any further. But at this point, I'm just going to say that even these early readers didn't call it anything. They didn't say this book is called X, this book is called that, that was inside molds or something. They just said he made this and then he did this and then he dictated some and then he preached some and that's, that's how it got to be together. So that's what Enraciones is. Um, and the whole complicated story that I just sort of indicated um, tells us a few things. First of all, it explains why the whole thing is so extremely long. What we have here is something that came together in many, many steps. It explains why there is a certain amount of inconsistency. And also, since there are many, many sermons about the same thing, it explains why there is a great deal of repetition in it if you regard it as a book. So the book, when it became a book, still has the signs of it being an oral thing, something that was created purely orally and was never reworked to actually make a book. Um, that caused a bit of problem for, the, for people after Augustine. Cassiodorus, when he writes his commentary, says that Augustine's work is confusing and overly long, so he feels that he has to write uh, some commentary to help against that. Um, yeah, and that brings us to what is basically a follow-up of what I've just said, the short history of the composition. Um, uh, you will see that there's a, there's a reason for that. Remember, at first we have, well, I didn't actually clearly say that, so don't, don't forget the remember, and just uh, look at this with me. The first step in the creation of Enerationes in Psalmos, as we call it, was Augustine actually writing, or possibly it being antiquity, dictating a line by line, a verse by verse, half verse by half verse commentary, a written book. This was for Augustine quite early. This was in the 390s. And this is the very beginning. Beatus, Gvir, Quinon, and so on and so on. And then he says, and this is, has to be understood to be said about Jesus Christ. Then he goes back to the first line and says, Beatus, Gvir, and, and explains that one. And then he goes to the next, next half line and explains that one. So you see that this is a true line by line commentary. It follows the text. Um, as it as as necessary, and it's actually quite short. It doesn't make for much of a text. It's sort of a, a basis for a text, if you want so. So Augustine explains one through thirty-two. Um, all of these explanations belong together. This is a book. How do we know that? Because in in later explanations, he will refer back. He will cross-reference himself within the book. So it could be that he wanted to write this until the end of the cycle. These things are short enough to be called little commentaries, commentarioli, as Jerome says. Um, step two. Step two, Augustine is overwhelmed by, I mean, is overcome by his career and he has to start preaching. And he gives up on this project and starts preaching. The bulk of Enerations in Salmos is produced by by sermons. So these were preached and they were preached in a, a directly, I mean, they were preached, how do you say, improvised. Um, let's take a look at the beginning of one of these sermons that is actually quite typical, although I can would say that this is a very, very good sermon. So this is how it starts. And remember the last text that we had and how different this is. The delight of divine scripture and the sweetness of understanding the word of God with him himself, who gives us this sweetness. Um, you can hear that I am, I am uh, sight translating. <laughs> so that our, our land give its, our soil give its fruit. Um, it exhorts us, this goes back to the Lectatio and Tulcedo, exhorts us to speak and exhorts you to listen. And I see that you listen without disdain, sine facidio, and he's happy about that. And, and, and in the last sentence, where we look more ergo, um, therefore, let me talk to you today as well, as much as the Lord will give me, de ipso de isto psalmo quem modo cantavimus, about the psalm that we've just sung. What does that tell us? 
but can we learn from this little passage? First of all, it's a completely different beast of what we just said. This is highly emotional. This is highly rhetorical. This does exactly what in classical times was called captatio benevolentiae. You try to get your listeners to like you, to get your listeners to, uh, to listen to you. Um, he does so by interacting, by a little bit flattering his listeners, by saying, I can see that you are all expecting um, me to speak something interesting. I'm like, I, I can see that you are not already bored or something like that. So some kind of interaction, some kind of um, emotional appeal. And as you can see, this is an actual sermon. This has a here and now, this has a liturgical context. Um, this is what we have just sung. The Psalms are not only present as the text to be interpreted, but as the text that everybody just joined in singing. Um, so this is a this is the vast majority of what Augustine will do with the Psalms, and we can sort of understand why. Um, we know from Augustine's own words that these sermons are fully improvised to some degree, improvised on the spot because he there's a famous example where somebody read the lector read the wrong psalm, and Augustine had to improvise the sermon that he had not even uh, that he had not prepared mentally at all. Uh, we also know from Augustine that these sermons were taken down by stenographers, that is to say, they are very close to the spoken word. What we have here is actually as close as you can possibly get before recording devices. The way they were produced is, is not, I'm, I'm not going to say random, but the order is not the, not the numerical order. So he preaches, and he being Augustine, he preaches in Hipporegius, he preaches in Carthage, he preaches in Utica, he preaches in all sorts of places, all over the Western North Africa. And <laughs> this is where he also preaches in Rationus im Salmos. Many of them were preached in Carthage, where Augustine was a sort of um, highly welcomed guest preacher. And uh, apparently the psalm sermons were good enough for the, for the capital, where he would preach, um, where he would preach his, his best stuff. Um, the interesting thing is that while he preaches in this topsy-turvy way, I mean, completely numerically disorganized, somebody clearly kept a record, and the record must have been in order to complete the book. So there are certain overlaps between group one and group two, but not too many. Apparently, Augustine switched his genre, switched his method of producing, but did not switch his idea of making a full commentary. That in itself is quite interesting. Okay, and that brings us to the year 415, and I'm never very good in, in calculating how old he is, but he's getting old. Um, and in 415, he writes a letter where he explains to somebody that he has done a great deal of work. He has written a lot, and among other things, he has dictated three explanations of Psalms, three separate commentaries of Psalms. And these three separate commentaries of Psalms, we have seen the passage before, are actually the numerically first three that he never preached on. What does that tell us? Augustine has given up on his project of preaching everything. He has at that point in 415 decided to fill the gaps. And he does so by speaking and somebody else is, is writing it down, that is to say by dictating. Now at this point, you could of course uh, raise the question, which I'm raising all the time, what is the exact difference? Now, what is the difference between a bishop standing in church and preaching and the bishop standing in his home, surrounded by all the visitors and disciples and monks of his household and dictating? The same sort of thing. So can we actually define what exactly is a liturgical background? That's pretty complicated, but for the moment, let's just stick to the fact that these are the long dictated generaciones, and they do change a little bit. They don't quite look like the sermons. Look at this example, for example, where he says that the, this, this, this psalm, this is 71, starts with the words in Salomonum. Um, but this is so, this is said in such a way that it cannot, it cannot perfect, it cannot possibly refer to Solomon, the bishop, uh, the, the, the king of Israel. Therefore, it has to refer to Christ. That's sort of jumping into the subject matter pretty fast. 
this is not the dulcedo the, the, the Likiai that we had in the in the sermon. This is not catering to the audience. This is not building a, a rapport or anything like that. That is pretty straightforward. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so we do see a difference. Now, this is the third step. And the third step goes until the early 420s, and that's pure um, guess. The fourth step is interestingly just one psalm. It's the big psalm that is that is in, in our number, in, in, in modern numbering, in Hebrew numbering, 119, in ancient uh, Septuagint numbering, 118, the, the, the psalm that is Abbasidarian, whose um, verses follow the Hebrew alphabet. And Augustine sort of skipped that. He skipped that and everybody was angry at him for not doing that. And the fratres were grumbling at him. He tells us all that in his, in his preface. And at some point he gives up and he says that, okay, I have I've preached, and this is the beginning of this uh, text, I have um, explained all the Psalms, which we know are in the Codex of Psalms, which in the church, according to the custom of the church, is called the Psalterium. And I've, I've explained them part in sermon ginando in populis, partly by preaching in a congregation and partly by dictating um, with the help of the Lord as I could. And then he goes on to explain, as I said, that he had not done so for 118. Um, so when he finally does, so he makes an interesting decision. He decides to statue autem per sermones id agere qui proferantur in populis. So I decided to do this through sermons, which should be so that they can be um, pronounced in the public, so that they can be performed, performed is not the right word, uh, you know what I mean, um, in, in the public, which the Greeks call homilias. Uh, the, and everything about that passage is, of course, extremely interested for, interesting for somebody interested in, in literary genre. Um, apparently, what Augustine is doing, the elderly Augustine, we are in the mid, early 420s, what Augustine is doing is he's now dictating sermons. He's now making up sermons at his desk with his scribe in front of him. He's not actually uh, preaching. Uh, and he's, he's more than that. He's saying that um, he's, he's creating these sermons so that they may be preached by somebody else. That is quite interesting, given how uh, much Augustine thinks of orality and improvisation, so how much he thinks that this is exactly not what you should do, that is to say, read somebody else's sermon. So this time he's actually doing that. And another interesting thing that is not directly in Rationes related, but interesting in itself, is that he calls these sermones sermones. Now, sermo is a Latin word that means a hundred different things and is not a genre name. So he has to explain it by using the Greek term and saying, I am using what is, I am, I'm, I'm writing what is called homilias, homilies. Um, there's no Latin word yet that identifies homilies. Okay, so this one is really interesting thing. 32 things, quas Greki homilias vocant. This finishes the composition of Enerationis im Salmos. Like so often, Augustine finishes his books, with the exception of early works that he actually gave up on. Augustine doesn't leave stuff open. He finishes practically everything. Um, let's get back for a moment to the passage that I showed you before, that, that work list um, that is connected with the name of Augustine's biographer, Posidius, and maybe is most likely some form of a library catalog of Augustine's own library this complicated text that doesn't really make sense. And I'll just point out one important passage. And that is that in this list of works that are tractati, and tractati in Latin means, and in late Latin means uh, preached in popolo tractati, and some that are dictati, and then we have in popolo disputati, so between sermons and dictated, there is one that the author of this list does not want to make a statement on. Ex capto centesimo octavo decimo, the 118th Psalm doesn't fall into any of these categories. It's ex capto. It's, it's, so all of the others are sermons with the exception of 118. 118 is not mentioned in any of the categories. 
that has given rise to the assumption that the, this text, the, the Indicorum of Presidius, was created before 118 was created, was, was written, was composed by Augustine, and that means before around 422. So that is a, a little detail. But I mean, here we get this, this whole long, complicated explanation of what Enerationis is or how it came to be. What are the takeaways that we can get from this? We have, as I said, a multi-generic work that also has a genre flexibility, dynamic in it. Genre is not a stable thing. The style changes according to the genre or the subgenre. The principles of exegesis, interestingly, change not a lot. Uh, that is Augustine for you. Augustine is really, I think, an extremely consistent author compared to others. But what does that mean? The fact that he doesn't rework, he doesn't make a book out of it, keeps it as it is. That means that the literary form in this case wasn't all that important to him. He is happy for this book to be used, reused, rewritten, re-preached, most importantly. Um, I, I personally am even of the opinion that he wants the sermon nature of the sermons to show, that is to say, the, the elements that make a sermon specific, daily, current, that those elements are actually in there, that he will say, today, this and this is happening, because he thinks of sermons as so very, very specific and in the moment and, yeah, current. Um, okay, and that brings us to the next subchapter and how are we on time? Um, I am actually uh, pretty far in my in my presentation, so I, I, I think I will, um, although I'm mathematically uh, not gifted and therefore I've forgotten how much time I have, I hope I will not keep you too long. Um, in which context was this whole complicated, massive amount of work, this big, big book done? Um, the, the artwork that I am indulging myself this time with, I, I really like that one um, because it, it shows it shows the, the consecration of Augustine. So Augustine surrounded by all sorts of bishops um, who make him a bishop. And honestly, if you think that this was the man who came to North Africa to be a monk, who came to North Africa to be free of his worldly uh, complications and just sit down and read the Bible. And this is where he ends up. I mean, you can see sort of a, I don't think it was intended by the artist to be a scared face, but in a way it must have been. In a way, this, this is what is happening to somebody who is not entirely prepared for it. Um, let's take a quick look at the timeline and let's keep just Augustine out of this whole mess. Augustine who gets in this picture a nice black background and here he is on his own and not quite sure how to handle what is thrown at him. So in the late 380s, Augustine returns to Tagaste, to his father's house, his um, uh, deceased father's house that he has inherited, to live a monastic life there, to live the life of a philosopher that he had always wanted and to, to joined by friends and to not, no longer be involved in the, the, uh, the whole, um, in, 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 in his daily complications that he had in Milan. Uh, not much later, in 391, Augustine visits the city of Hippo Regius, and you may have heard the story that Augustine didn't want to be anything like a bishop, and he knew he was in danger of being acclaimed. Um, so he only visits places with a sitting bishop, among others, the city of Hippo Regius, um, where there was a bishop called Valerius, and Augustine therefore thought he was safe. So he goes there and is immediately, goes to mass, is immediately acclaimed by everybody. And since the voice of the people is the voice of God, um, he is acclaimed as presbyter and ordained on the spot as presbyter and is also more or less fixing, uh, firmly acclaimed to be the future bishop. Moreover, in 394, with the bishop still alive, he is consecrated at what we now a coadjutor that is highly irregular and we'll get back to why why all these irregular things were happening so the whole thing was a process where they really pressured Augustine into it he tells us in various places that he was in tears about it and in 396 he became the bishop of Hippo 
So what was going on? Sorry, wrong direction. Um, between 388 and 391, we get, I mean, Augustine still writing his, his philosophical books, I mean, like the Musica, and still following up on his Manichaean problem that he had had. In 391, immediately after having been acclaimed, he writes a panicky letter to his bishop Valerius and says, I cannot do this. I mean, this is too soon. I haven't learned what I should learn. I've actually a passage of that here. My duty is to study with diligence all the remedies which the scriptures contain for such a case as mine and to make it my business by prayer and reading to secure that my soul be endured with the health and vigor necessary for labor so responsible. This I have not yet done because I have not yet time. So time is what he needs and time is what he asks for. He asks for his duties to be delayed for some time so that he can actually study the Bible. So this is the time in which Augustine must have become the, this incredible machine of, of Bible knowledge, of, of this incredible a database of knowing practically everything in the Bible that he wants to know and finding all the right connections. This is when Augustine becomes Augustine as we know him in those years when he reads and reads and reads. This is also when he writes his first serious exegetical projects. Most of them are unfinished. Um, and he also starts writing the sub commentary. So you see that we are already in an interesting environment. Um, immediately after this consecration, he writes his first anti-Donatist work. So he enters into the big problem that is the, the schism that is besetting North Africa at the time. And he writes the handbook that he's going to write for himself on preaching and on exegesis called on Christian teaching, De Doctrina Christiana. And it starts out by, there are two things on which all interpretation of scripture depends, the mode of ascertaining the proper meaning and the mode of making known the meaning when it is ascertained. That is to say, there are all of a sudden two duties here and they're firmly linked for Augustine until the end of his life, preaching and exegesis. Exegesis for Augustine in most cases is preaching Preaching for Augustine in all cases is more or less exegesis. Um, I, I find it interesting that, so, okay, that in this time when Augustine reads and reads and reads the Bible and writes and writes and writes his first psalm commentaries and then gives up because he has to start preaching and doesn't have the time any, any longer for that, that this is also not so very long before Confessions. And Confessions is, as you all know, the book that is fully imbued with the Psalter. This is the book where Augustine really gives in to all the inspiration that he got from reading the Bible. And I, I think I see here a connection. But starting with the year 400, Augustine is fully employed by the whole anti-Donatist uh, situation, the anti-Donatist crisis. And we see already what we have here is an, an explanation for the for the sorry I didn't mean to do that an explanation for the whole stress that that surrounds Augustine's um, acclamation and and uh, consecration the whole thing that he had to be almost lured into this into this role and had to be acclaimed so that he couldn't protest um, he was really 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 needed why was he really needed because of the Donatist case and that's where we see that. Whatever he does around that time is part of a big project, part of a big, yeah, um, exegetical, but mostly preaching project. And that is where the whole some commentary idea starts. Okay, so what can we take away from what we've just said? Innovationes accompanies and responds to the specific challenges of what we can say the first half of Augustine's bishopric until the conference in Carthage when the Donatists were at least officially um, conquered uh, and made uh, illegal. Um, and we can sort of bring that around three questions. What do we do with the Bible? How do we read it? How do we interpret it? How do we utilize it? Very importantly for Augustine. Um, and of course, the, the, all these Bible questions go back to his former problem with the Manichaeans, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, how do I use all of this to unite, to build, to strengthen a congregation in times of a challenge, in times of crisis? How do I rebuild the Catholic Church in North Africa vis-a-vis -vis the Donatists that apparently had a lot of um, allure for many people? 
and how do I, since Augustine comes as a rhetorician, comes as an orator, how do I preach? How do I teach? How do I find and invent and use a new rhetorical style? So this is what is really interesting about Enerationes, and I am almost at my end. So I am going to skip my next subchapter and just tell you the takeaways. This is Titian, by the way, I'm sorry about being... Anyway, so the next, the, the takeaway of the next thing, does it even have a takeaway? Is what is the custom sound text? And the basic thing that, that everybody um, that is, is well known is that Augustine Psalm text is not the Vulgate. It's a text he, he knows of and he knows the Vulgate and he doesn't like it at all. Uh, so he uses uh, a specific uh, Latus Latina, old Latin text that he apparently found in Italy, but he uses, if necessary, other versions as well. So his, his use of the psalm text is flexible, dynamic, and non-dogmatic. It's not based on philological principles. He was not super interested in the details of the word. It's based on pastoral principles and, may I say, on rhetorical principles, the two of them coming together in the word homiletic. Um, it's a Jesus for Augustine consists not of explaining the text, but of bringing text and listeners together, making the text uh, literally the words of the of the listeners to make the listeners understand that they are really the ones speaking this text. Why is that a very much a psalm thing? Because they have already done so. They have already sung the psalm, so they are really in a, in a kind of, of of mode where they they can see themselves as in the role of almost the psalmist. And that brings us to our last chapter. How does Augustine actually read the Psalms? May I have like five more minutes? Is that okay? Yes, this is more than okay. Thank it's you. Um, seven and a half. So thank you very much. I hope that five minutes will do it. Okay, so now we have all the all the basis of 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 what we what we need for for the big question. What does he do as a Psalm exegete? What is Psalm exegesis for Augustine? And I'm really scratching the surface here. I called this Augustine's homiletic psalm exegesis, then I reconsidered and thought that this is really Augustine's psalm exegesis. And then I reconsidered and thought, is this really Augustine's exegesis? All these principles that we can talk about for Augustine for everything that he does. And that's an open question. And I will give you my answer at the end for this open question, but let's just move through this very quickly. Much of this is probably known to most of you. Um, Let's, let's um, reconsider some of the things that I said. Most of Augustine's exegesis, most of Augustine's exegesis, not just the Psalter, is in fact homiletic. So his big three commentaries on the uh, tractate of John, the tractate of the, of the epistle of John and the and the Generationus in Salmos are homiletic. The one big exception from, from this rule that exegesis is homiletic is, of course, Genesis, which he explains in big written commentaries, but practically, yeah, and a little bit of early works. But still, uh, what I'm saying holds that for many Latin church fathers, and in particular for Augustine, exegesis is firmly linked to the idea of preaching. What does that mean? It takes place in a specific liturgical context, in a specific place at a specific time, with a specific audience, very much with an audience. It therefore follows rhetorical principles as much as epistemic principles, and it will always be an interaction, a conversation. It will involve engagement with the audience. Um, what that means for Augustine, it really means, as I said, finding ways to build the bridge. And uh, if you look at this one, that's the beginning of 51, let us hear in this psalm, our own voice, that is the voice of the citizens of the heavenly kingdom, and let us join in this voice with our ears and tongues and hearts and words. Therefore, let's sing the psalm and afterwards realize that these are really our words, that we are really the ones who, who speak that. This is not something back in, in old Israel. Um, so how does one do that? 
There's a famous scheme concept principle that for Augustine that we call the totus Christus scheme. And it starts out with a famous question, uh, the, the standard question for some exegetes around Augustine, before Augustine, after Augustine, which is more or less the question of who is the speaker of the Psalms? Who is the person who says, my Lord, my Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, there's a second important question for some exegetes that doesn't interest Augustine in the slightest, and that is who wrote the Psalms? Who sang them first? He doesn't ever discuss that. He couldn't care less. This is not the problem because, I mean, now they are ours. Now they are alive. There are, of course, all sorts of possibilities. I mean, like one person, a specific person, the people of Israel, the Christians as a community, Christ, as in the psalm that I just quoted, my Lord, my Lord, why hast thou forsaken me, and the church as a whole body. Now, what Augustine does, what Augustine's genius idea is as a follow-up of this kind of question, of this kind of exegesis, is putting it all together and saying, this all is the totus Christus. This is really all Christus. And he argues for this. I have a long passage on that here where he says that we are the body and Christ is the head and you can go on about that. that his entire body is the church and we are the limbs. And there are many passages in Augustine uh, that, that repeat that. And let's think about that, not from a purely theological standpoint, but also, a, again, literary rhetorical standpoint and say the following. What happens? You can combine all of these things in one sermon. What does that mean? You can unify. You can say, OK, each of you is Christ. All of you are Christ. All of us are Christ. We are together and are saying this as Christ. Sorry about this. Um, so the, 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 the idea, what I was saying before, that, that Augustine's preaching in his time of, of, of uh, crisis is a preaching of unification, of identity, of belonging, very well works with the Totus Christus. Another thing that really works well is actualization, making the text current and making the text relevant for every speaker. And the third thing that happens, of course, is that if you, if you unite all of this, you can put it into a into a historical system. You can say, okay, the church grew, the church became the church. So you can start with a single speaker, you can go on to the incarnation and crucifixion, and you can then go on to Pentecost and the church and the present day church and congregation. In other words, the whole idea of the dispensation, the whole idea of the history of salvation can be embedded and is many times embedded in Enerationes in Psalmos. So you see how the purely not purely, but the theological concept of Totus Christus can be used in a pedagogical, rhetorical way. And you can see what these sermons actually do. You can sort of imagine what it feels like to come out of this community, to feel anew that you're part of this community and what binds it together, namely a history that goes back to King David, but also um, the being part of the body of Christ. Um, to put this in the words of Michael Cameron, it's the only uh, quotation that I have <laughs> that is uh, not by Augustine, Totus Christus is not merely a theme, or even the most important central doctrine of, of Augustine's preaching. It rather forms the very atmosphere of the sermons, a subterranean stream of ever-flowing experience. What does he say? He says that this is not only true for Enerationes. Enerationes are sort of where this happens, but it's true for every single preaching, every single pre preached work of Augustine, this whole concept. What do we learn from that? We learn that inerationes are Augustine's sandbox, and that's the argument that I would like to make. And inerationes are Augustine's quintessential sermons. They are the sermons that tell us how to read all the other sermons, basically. There are other things that we needed, would need to talk about. I may just refer to the way he uses scripture. I mean, this, this network, this web of scripture that is so obscenian. Um, the way he uses, uh, he creates what I would like to uh, call a virtual reality, rather than referring to the outside reality. Augustine is really, really calls on, on referring to what is actually going on in the world. Instead, he builds a world for his community in a dark church to to relate to. It's like a play that you know, sometimes he is play acting as a know. Um, and there's also there's an, an embodied element 
to it. Augustine, the preacher, very much uses his body, his his ability to to stand there and, and uh, gesture and be in this place. Um, and as I said, all of this happens in Augustine's sermons, not just in the sermons on the Psalms, but the Psalms were sort of the theme where he learned it. Um, I have one last um, quotation that I am going to skip. This is nothing but a very beautiful Augustinian in con- uh, uh, statements from the beginning that tells us either look at, look at these words and you will see immediately what I'm talking about. Multa membra sub uno capite, unus homos und unios hominis vox in plenum quen salmis auditur. At sic clamat unus tam from omnes, and this one shouts out like all because all in the one are one. Um, so thank you very much for your patience. Um, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gundi, for a fascinating talk. I think everyone would agree with me that uh, uh, you have shared your enthusiasm for Augustine and for the uh, Enarationes in Psalmos with us, that, for showing us uh, thank you for showing us uh, that it's uh, not a book in the traditional sense, as we may perceive it, but rather a sandbox, as you said, or a collection of commentaries with this ever-changing voice that is multi-generic and yet so uh, so uh, consistent um, in its exegesis. I liked uh, the idea that you, you know, um, um, express at the end uh, that it's, you know, the, the bringing together uh, the text and the, the listeners, the, the text and the audience, um, and um, how um, the idea of totus Christus just is this overarching uh, principle behind all this. Thank you so much. Um, now is uh, the time for questions and discussion, and I would not uh, like to take too much of uh, your time uh, by thanking you more. Um, I think we we can all applaud uh, your uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, now uh, I'm giving uh, uh, our audience the time to uh, to ask questions, uh, both very general and uh, uh, very specific, as as you said at the beginning. And I can see that Samira has raised her hand. So over to you, Samira. Uh, hello. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, so I found that really interesting. And what I particularly found interesting is when you talked about how the Enoraciones were composed sort of orally, that they were delivered as sermons and from sermons turned into commentaries and so on. So my question is, um, I don't know much about the manuscript tradition of them, but I was wondering about the types of manuscripts that they tended to be found in. So, for example, in the earliest manuscripts, do they tend to be found in context associated with preaching, or are they only ever found in manuscripts more suggested as kind of frosted and common proof? You know, were they ever actually preached, or were they only sort of a, a faking the atmosphere of having them preached in a manuscript usage? Sorry. Um, thank you very much. That's an interesting and broad question. Uh, let me start by saying that we have to keep apart um, late antiquity, um, about which we learned little, and, and the Middle Ages. So the, the, I think that we can say that the, the switch from the single sermon, well, actually, I mean, that, that's a good question. Were Augustine's sermons ever re-preached? That is the basic question. Um, I, I don't know that we know about Enerationus. We know about Lactatus in Evangelium Johannes. We know about his, his Gospel on John, where he expressly says to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to somebody who he's writing in, in Carthage, and he says, these need to be preached, and then I'll send you more. So he actually thinks of them as preaching material, even when he himself does no longer preach. Um, we don't know anything like that about enerationes. So enerationes are not part, for example, of the later, uh, um, little later um, sermon collections that were definitely made for preachers by Caesarius of Arles. There are no enerationes in there. Enerationes are not part of the medieval homiliaries. So relatively early, you could say the Augustine Psalm commentary became a commentary. 
uh, they are not um, connected in, uh, in, in manuscripts with anything because Enerationes in Salmos is so long that it takes up typically three large volumes. Um, and earlier, earlier um, that's an, an interesting question, the earliest manuscripts of Enerationes were about um, uh, 10 of the, of the 10 Enerationes are one, that means we have roughly sort of 15 books. This is what Cassiodorus tells us. Cassiodorus tells us I am writing a book on the Psalms and Augustine wrote 15, which is of course really interesting because that tells us that his, his copy had 15 volumes. Um, but in the high middle ages, when the, when the, the script becomes small enough um, to, to write, um, most of these volumes are three volume. So the, the Quinquagena in the 50s. Um, so they are not joined with anything at all because they are like three books. Um, so we really, really don't know much about re-preaching and whether it happened at all. We do know that it happened for Augustine, but I don't think we know anything about Enerationes. But part of that is, and that's the last sentence I'm saying about this, part of that is that um, the, the Psalter became very much a monastic text that in the, in the early period of when it becomes, when, when we have the, 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 the manuscript um, transmission, the manuscript propagation, um, we have all these Benedictine manuscripts. So every Benedictine monastery has an Enerationis uh, copy to, to go and look up what it is that they sing every day. So these are not texts that necessarily are made, um, are considered to be preached. So I'm not sure if that is a good enough answer, but that's what I know about the subject. Thank you. Um, I can see that Professor Kuczynski wants to ask a question, but before I um, um, uh, before I ask him to to ask it, I, I just wanted to to tell you that we've got some uh, thank you notes in the uh, uh, on chat uh, from uh, uh, people who say thank you, thank you. It was a great conference. So I just wanted to uh, let you know about that. And uh, 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 Professor Kuczynski, uh, over to you, please. Thank you, thank you so much, Gundy. That was that was a fantastic paper. Um, I have a, a comment and a question. So my comment has to do uh, with approving of your mentioning at the end of your talk, the playfulness of the Enerationes, because I think, you know, when, when I've taught uh, the history of biblical commentary exegesis to students, you know, they think of it as such a tedious uh, enterprise, you know, something which is just, you know, kind of grinding this long, um, accretive tradition. It's like a, a snowball, you know, going down, um, going down a summit and, and just kind of rolling over them. So this idea of, of Augustine at play, you know, in the, in the Psalter is, is really, compelling, I think. And in, in one of the Enerationes, I can't remember which one, he begins by describing the language of the Psalms using the word involucrum, mm -hmm. uh, you know, referring to the, uh, you know, the kind of decorative paper you would use to wrap up a, a package, you know, and how he's going to unwrap, unwrap the, the package of the Psalms, you know, almost like a, you know, a child on, on Christmas mm -hmm. morning. So, I really, I, you know, I love that idea of Augustine being playful and, you know, seriously playful mm. in in writing, uh, in uh, preaching and uh, dictating on the Psalms. So that's that was great. I really love that that ending. My question has to do with Erasmus, who is one of my great heroes, um, and. I hadn't really thought about this until, you know, you talked about the title, of course, that he's responsible for, for, for this collection of dictations and, and sermons, Enerationes. Um, you know, I remember, I, I remember from my study of Erasmus as an undergraduate that, you know, he very controversially translated the opening line of John's gospel as in principio erat sermo yeah. rather than verbum. 
And he chose sermo rather than verbum because he explained by way of um, his use of another Augustine text, I think, that what happened at the incarnation uh, was um, God thinking to and therefore talking to himself. And, you know, this was the dynamic of the incarnation. So verbum, you know, from Erasmus's point of view, did not capture that, that idea of vocality. And I wonder if when, you know, even though Erasmus is turning these oral texts into a literary text by giving them the title Enerationes in Salmos, I wonder if he isn't, you know, being very careful to try to imply by his choice of word, an oratio, a uh, an oral dimension to to these texts. You know, in in Cicero's orations, he's you know his his um, speeches for the defense, he's always referring to narrationes credibiles. Mm -hmm. you know, credible verbal accounts of yeah. you know, by witnesses. So I wonder if, you know, I take your point that, you know, Erasmus is responsible for turning these oral texts into a literary text. But I wonder if he isn't trying by way of his choice of title to, you know, remind the reader that these were originally spoken or, you know, dictated or delivered as sermons. What, what do you think about that? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a classicist, so I don't, I don't pretend to, to be an expert on this. I'm not an Erasmus scholar, but I think this is a fascinating idea. Uh, let me just uh, clarify something that apparently I messed up in my talk. Um, Erasmus is not the first editor. So when Erasmus edits the, ah. the, the, the Opera Omnia, uh, he already, there are already, I think, there's definitely the the um, no am I completely blocked? Can can somebody give me the first Augustine edition um, in 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 Basel? Uh, <laughs> when we come to it, it's it's very very obvious. I mean it's it's very um, anyway. So there is already there are already at least three um, early editions of Inaciones, and there are already early full Opera Omnia editions, which not always necessarily include Enerationes for a complicated right. reason, because they were they followed uh, Augustine's Retractationes, in which it's not included. So um, Augustine, uh, Erasmus isn't really the one responsible. He's just moving on this, this, um, this movement that has already made Generationes into a big fat book that you yeah. students and many other people don't like that much. Um, but uh, the, the 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 question whether Generationes is the, whether he he means um, verbal the act of explaining something is fascinating for me because Generationes is I believe an ancient title for a late ancient title for people who write a commentary on I don't know Virgil I'm making that up if it's Virgil I really don't know but I mean there are late ancient literary commentaries that are called Generationes yeah now the interesting thing about them is that they are oral too that they are uh I mean, school texts, basically. So yes. the kind of commentaries that we, we have also refer back to an oral situation. So I, I think it's very likely, I mean, it's, it's, it's easily possible that Erasmus being the guy that he was, that he would have known that and that he would have, um, I mean, the one thing that he didn't do, that he fascinatingly didn't do, is he didn't call it commentary. Um, right. So the word commentarius, which really means written thing, Hmm. It's not what he uses. So I, I, I must say I do like the idea. That yeah, this just is actually. Yeah, go ahead. Just as Sorry. a quick, just as a quick footnote to what you just said, um, a friend of mine in Oxford, and Sue would know about this, uh, is editing a, a Middle English biblical summary, which is also a commentary, mm -hmm. in a Trinity College manuscript, ninety three. And that text begins by calling itself a declaration, mm -hmm. a declaration of the Bible. So I think that what these terms 
an oratio and declaration in, mm -hmm. in Middle English must mean is something like, you know, what we would call a discourse. Yeah, that's um, good. Mm -hmm. You know, something, like something spoken to an yeah. audience that is yeah. delivered to others, you know, mm -hmm. not cogitated for one's personal use, but mm -hmm. delivered to others. And that's what's so compelling about what you have to say about the Anoraciones and Salmos to me, that this is this is something, you know, Augustine takes pleasure in it himself, but he also takes pleasure in unwrapping, you know, the gift box for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, that's fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, I hope it, he took pleasure in it. I think he did because it was one of these, I mean, consummate uh, rhetoricians. But I mean, he also just knows that this is what you have to do. I mean, you stand yeah. in front of a of a, a, a bunch of people who are bored and it's the last chance of the day or whatever <laughs> and, and you you just you just pull yourself together and do this thing. yes yeah and he he does that i mean that's the the, the, <laughs> the eternal wisdom of how how rhetoric works so the captatio benevolentia and and he for him it's a really important thing because he needs to draw them in and, and make them feel part of it um sorry thank I you really thank you so much for thank your you excellent much. paper it was excellent <laughs> thank you thank you uh, some more thank yous again uh, on chat and uh, magda hajinska is in line with the next question okay thank you gondi this was just amazing it was great really like i wish i had said um two hours and then you would have been still talking about that um, I, I can be, I mean, I can see myself doing that. Sorry yes, about that. Yes, but I, I'm, yes. Yeah. I've but seen you can, do we that. Can, we can always ask Gunti to return next year. Yes. <laughs> yes, we're planning to do that. Right, that's a good idea. Well, what I, what I, well, I loved every bit and part of it, but what I also liked very much was that you seem to like Augustine very much and to admire him and to appreciate his work. It speaks through how you talk about him, how you present him, and I really, really like it. And you shown him, you showed him as a person very conscious of the audience, whether oral or well, whether listeners or readers, and as a person who really, really wants to get his meaning across. And that is related to two questions that I have. One concerns the difference between a text that was preached and a text that was dictated. You said that there were slight differences. Well, he must have been aware of, well, the text being delivered and listened to, that has to be delivered and presented in a way that is different than if you mean this text to be read. So that was one, uh, that is one of my questions. What kind of differences, what kind of rhetorical differences, what kind of, how you can actually verify the fact. I mean, you know that he's dictating, you know that he's preaching. How does that actually translate functionally into the kind of text that he produces? That is one question. And the other question that is also related to him being very aware of his audience is, um, relate. it is related to his base text. Because he was, as you said, he was preaching or he was writing about a text that was well known to the audience. They have just sung the text or uh, whether during his performance or well b before his, uh, his preaching or in uh, during the ceremonies as well um, on the whole. And now the choice of text, you said he didn't like the Vulgate. Well, many people didn't then, right? But um, he said he, he used the Vetus. There was more than one tradition. Um, I read in your book that he used the um, Salterium Veronensis, but was his choice dictated in any way or synchronized with what he assumed his readers and his listeners would be uh, um, familiar with? Because he used these words and then he paraphrased, explained, said what it all meant to him. So did he factor that in? In other words, did he base his homilies on the text that he knew was familiar and in circulation? Sorry. Wonderful question. Give me an hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> First question, how can we tell the difference? There are certain telltale signs. One clearly telltale sign is that Augustine will address his audience. So when he says in a sermon, when he says, when he says in, uh, in, an, in a ratio, he says, typically he will say caritas vestra, carissimi, or something like that. So these, these terms were brothers and sisters. 
something like that, fratres, very often not fratres, of course, just fratres. Um, these things tell us, since Augustine is unlikely to make this up, there's one group of sermons that I know of, three sermons that are problematic, that sound like they, that, that seem to may, may go against that rule. I don't really know. But on the whole, Augustine doesn't fake orality, not this kind of fake. Um, he also doesn't, for example, he doesn't fake letters. So his letters are always actual true letters, um, which is different from other people, obviously. Um, uh, other, other things are this beginning, this, this very, very noticeable um, a beginning that that sort of um, an introduction, a little premium for the for the explanation. You have that in all sermons. You do not have it in the non sermons. So there are signs that are clear. It's not quite as clear cut as I made it out to be. There are a few subgroups where it gets a little bit more complicated. Actually, one subgroup where we can where we have this impression that this is sort of like a a draft version or something like that. It's not quite a sermon. So, but with the exception of those, we have it's it's pretty obvious, pretty obviously clear what is going on here. Having said that, I would like to say that the situation, as I said, isn't all that clear. So Augustine doesn't dictate on his own. I mean, Augustine certainly dictates and there's just somebody, there's somebody listening in and, and there are all these people coming through. I mean, there, there's uh, one guy once for, uh, actually asks Augustine to write a work for him, dedicated to him. And Augustine thinks that this is, this is completely crazy and he writes back to him, you can come and listen in. Like everybody does. So people sort of circle in and out of his household and listen. That's apparently what happens. Um, so... The, the written and the oral isn't, uh, it's, it's not that, that clear cut, given that what is written is actually dictated, given that the audience may be any size from one to 50. Um, yeah, given that liturgical is a modern term, and uh, do we really know what a sermon is? So there are these things and it gets more complicated if you take into account um, other other groups of sermons like Tractatus and Evangelium Johannes, then, then it gets even, even more tricky and, and sort of fuzzy, the differences. Speaking of the psalm text, Augustine uses almost consistently a text that was probably not the text that his audience knew best. He brought an old Latin text, presumably, so that's the, uh, let's do this, one step back. Um, Augustine's old Latin text is quite consistent in itself and remarkably close to this specific Italian text that we have in a, in a um, bilingual text called the Citerium Veronese that is better known for people who study the Greek Old Testament because it's a, it's a Greek, um, an old Greek manuscript in Ansiris, but it's also an old Latin manuscript. So the Latin side of it is almost Augustine's text, almost to the word, to the letter, Augustine's text. Now, that is really interesting. I mean, you can ask, um, what kind of a book is that? Who made that? And I'm pretty sure that this is like an edition. Somebody made that Latin version and put it together with a Greek version. And just, this, it's, not a, it's not a random thing. It's, a, it's an, an edited text. And um, it's also not unlikely that it comes from Italy that it didn't move from Africa to Italy and back to Africa, but that Augustine brought it with him when he left Italy and went to Africa. Um, it's hard to prove something like that, but what we can say is that Augustine did so with a number of things. So he really sort of um, thought of, apparently thought of, he doesn't say that, but apparently thought of um, Italian or more specific Milanese, uh, Christianity as his as his ideal. That's what he wanted. So he would bring um, other customs, for example, and rules that Ambrose of Milan had had um, imposed on his church. He would bring them and impose them on his church in Hipporegius. So Augustine uses apparently and um, most likely Italian, Vetus Latina, old Latin text when he goes back to preaching in Africa. Now and again, he will, well, very often, he will preach in a place that is not his place, and somebody apparently hands him a codex and says, okay, here's our Psalter. And what Augustine does is that he uses quite often 
this text, he uses a text that isn't his text. And we can see that because not only is it different from the Veronese, but also he switches in the middle. In the middle, he forgets about the new text and remembers his own old text. So he will switch back to, to what he knows by heart, what, he, what his Veronensis is. So he has to take into account, or he tries to take into account people's personal sound versions, but he doesn't always do it perfectly. So sometimes he has two versions in a, in a site. And I have examples for that in the part that I skipped. Um, do people know the text? I would assume, yes, of course, they've just sung it or listened to it, depending on the specific liturgic sit liturgical situation. Um, apparently, there were um, psalms that were sung responsorially, and then there were some sung psalms that were recited by a lector. Um, but what he cannot rely on is that people understand the text. So this is, after all, an old Latin translation of a poetic Hebrew text. And uh, we all know that the Psalter is, even in, in Jerome's version, sometimes hard to understand. And this is not Jerome's version. So what he has to do is he has to explain entirely um, unintelligible sentences. And he has to explain sentences that are um, uh, that, that may not be, uh, that, that may sound um, counterintuitive or that may be um, offensive in some way. So this is the material out of which he creates what is basically um, simplified, let's say that, allegorical commentary. Um, so he can assume that people know the text. He cannot assume that people know what it means. So they want him to explain what it means. Thank you very much. I, I wish you hadn't skipped the parts that you skipped, but then we I, can I, resume I can and this. resume. <laughs> no, I can send you the thing if you want to. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I can see that, Professor, um, sorry, uh, we have some uh, more. Uh, right, Professor Kuczynski says that, she, that he has to leave us uh, because uh, he has another class and he... Uh, uh, he needs to be going, but he is uh, again thanking you for the uh, for the talk. Um, now uh, you said you had a meeting yourself, but can we have? Uh, no, we I have, have I have cancelled it. Oh, you have cancelled it. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So um, I can see that uh, Professor Gillingham would like to ask uh, her question. So uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. I, I can't tell you what a, pl a pleasure it was listening. I'm I'm writing up my second commentary on the Psalms. I've spent 25 years doing the first, and I'm now on Psalm 39 of the of the second round for Penguin. Um, and Wait. it made me think a huge amount about how commentaries come together. And I thought very much that the first question was actually you the way you answered it may have actually count of what I'm going to ask, but I don't think so. The first question was on manuscripts, the end of a process. And in our, in my Hebrew Bible Old Testament world, which is what I really live and work and research in, as well as reception history, um, we're really interested, as you probably know these days, about how the Psalter came to be a book. We don't ask questions about Psalms, but Psalter, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the whole literary unit. So from what you were saying, talking about the sheer diversity of, of, of how this commentary came about, not just in genre but and context, but um, collections of Psalms, maybe Psalms of Ascents coming a little bit, uh, maybe the 400s, maybe the 1 to 32 earlier on, yeah. but separate Psalms having different sort of iterations and so on. It made me ask the question, how on earth? Did this become a commentary? Who brought it about to be a book? Augustine, obviously, by 430 could no longer do so. And so my, my question is even more radical still, I think. Were, in this case, all the Psalms that we call the expositions of Augustine really by Augustine? Is it really um, a collection which started as his works, but then in order to create the, 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 the entirety, the chronological, you know, if you like the chronological, the ordering of the soldier from one to, to, to 150, how on earth did that sort of editorial process, that compilational process come about? Because by the time of Cassiodorus, we certainly see that, this, that there is a unit, there's something that has been commented on, state comment, uh, commentary by commentary, by uh, uh, taking up Augustine, and ditto the gloss by then, you know, Augustine's an authority. 
So my question is really, is the are the expositions all the work of Augustine? If so, who on earth put them together? Was it Augustine or did it happen a lot later? I don't think you probably have an answer, but I'm just fascinated about the process of commentary making. So thank you so much. Thank you. I, I think I do have an answer. I mean, this is not my answer, but that is sort of um, known. I mean, uh, I, I just was thinking when you were talking about, about the processes of things coming together and things then afterwards being regarded as a book, like the Psalter. Um, and I was thinking it doesn't, it, it's not like a, a, a steady flow. Mm. It is like, I mean, there's a, there's a chaotic phase and then it stabilizes. Then at some point, the Hebrew Bible is the Hebrew Bible and it's no longer just this, that, and the other. There are no versions, there's all of a sudden one. Then the whole thing gets translated by three, four, five, six, seven people, 72 people, whatever. And, and, and we have all sorts of different mm. possibilities. And at some point, we have the Septuagint. And it becomes a sort of stable thing, especially the post-origin Septuagint with the with those those uh, marginal notes become becomes a thing, and is no longer. Uh, there are very few passages that are that are a problem, really, compared to the the, the, the massive amount that is. And I mean, when it comes to Augustine, yeah, uh, the, the interesting thing is that there must have been a very chaotic or no, I'm, I'm taking that back. But a complicated dynamic process of making this book and a point when the book was just a book. And what you what you asked about and what I think is really, really interesting is that the process of it becoming a book must have been quite, quite early. And what does that mean? Augustine did it. Um, we have to, and that is that is a, a big, really interesting question. Um, what exactly went on in Hippodagius? How exactly did he not only keep his his materials together, the stuff that he wrote together? So he kept apparently very good records of everything that he did write, and part of that record keeping is the fact that he himself wrote this uh, this list of of, uh, of works uh, called Retractationes. So one point is that, and, and I mean that the whole, what do you say, this whole process of, of filling in the gaps and all of that means that he was on top of what was happening here. He created this book, if in a very um, unconventional way, yes. but he did, and he created it to be a book. Now, that raises the second question. Augustine dies in 430, and we enter into the migration period, and things are really uh, tricky. And we know that in 431, the city of Hipporegius fell to the Vandals. And in 430, when Augustine was dying, they were already there. They were besieging the city. They were around it. And Augustine was on his deathbed. And uh, later author Victor of Vita says that Augustine, uh, by way of, of depression and by way of um, um, despair over the situation, was the first victim of the Vandals. So how on earth did not only Enerationes, but the entire corpus of Augustine's works make it out of that chaos and into the Western world? Mm -hmm. The answer that has been given by many people is, um, specifically by Pierre Petit-Mangin, is um, uh, Posidius. Uh, Posidius, the... Uh, the biographer, the, the man who may or may not have put together the indiculum list, but certainly preserved it, who fled from the Vandals, who fled first from the Vandals into the city of Hipporegius, and then fled from Hipporegius to Italy, and apparently fled with the library. So apparently the, the manuscript traditions of several early Augustinian traditions starts in Italy, starts in southern Italy, and there's a there's a high likelihood, not much, uh, it seems starts in Ireland, which is unusual. Um, so it, it, it seems to be highly likely that somebody just took this whole bunch and brought it together to a place where it was safe. That's all that we know. And of course, at the time when that happened, Inerationis was already a book. It already had a beginning and an end and, and wasn't, wasn't um, bits and pieces. Was this book all by Augustine? I think this is extremely likely. I mean, if you read it, it's just so Augustinian. I mean, he's so, and that's one of the things that I really want to work on. But what do I mean when I say so Augustinian? Why is it so obvious that, that you open it on every, any, any given page and, and 
it, it sort of jumps out at you. I mean, he's he's quite um, quite typical. He's quite not like every other writer, with the exception of those who try to write like Augustine or, or quoted most of him. But in his own time, in his own world, I mean, it it, it really um, several little things happen. So uh, remember when we had when I showed you this Indicorum passage and I told you that there is a textual problem in it. There was one entry, and the entry was was um, uh, uh, struck through. So what happened here is that apparently um, one of the sermons got added. So one sermon is apparently not part of original Inationes. Um, that was only discovered, only argued by my colleague. Um, Clemens Weidmann in Vienna, and, and he argues on stylistic and literary principles that this is not an inneratio, this is a different kind of a sermon, and therefore it's an, it's an interesting parallel that on the one hand it's not an inneratio, and on the other hand um, the, the, the number is missing in the manuscripts of the Indiculum. So we shouldn't add it to the manuscripts of the Indiculum, but rather think that the sermon has been added. But that's a single thing. That's a single sermon that's been added to it. So it's not much. And then there is a small group of, of um, commentaries that were uh, sort of re reformulated, re reshaped in a in a in a very superficial way. Um, so a few little interventions, but not much. So more or less. Inerationis was transmitted to the Middle Ages like the City of God was, with, with bits and pieces that, that got a little changed, but not, not badly so. And the first thing that happens, that we can see happens very soon, is excerpting and, and shortening it. So excerpting it like bits and pieces of it for, for excerpt commentaries, uh, collections. Um, but there's also a very early full-length excerpt commentary of Inerationis that's just shortening it down. And this commentary, the man who did that, and that must have been in 6th century or something like that, um, the manuscript is 6th or early 7th century, um, that that um, excerpt was clearly interested in making it less of a sermon and more of a commentary. So it cuts out all the pieces that, that are too specific, too mm. interactive, too um, yeah, two sermon like in, in, in various ways. He's trying to um, basically he's trying to um, uh, follow the need of, of, of monasteries as opposed to the need of, of communities who listen to one sermon. Thank you. I shall certainly think more on this. It's fascinating. It is, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I now understand fully what Magda meant earlier, that, you know, uh, you can go on and on <laughs> endlessly when you start talking about Augustine. Uh, thank you so much. Are there any other questions, yeah. perhaps? Uh, we have some more notes, again, with thank yous. People have to leave for other classes. Mm, uh, I can see that in his note, uh, uh, Michael Kuczynski said that uh, uh, he sends his thanks not just to Gundi, but also to Magda uh, and the you know, organizers uh, for the series. And he says, see everyone for the next meeting with Psalms and Psalters that will happen in a month. Uh, a memorable session. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm just reading from, uh, from the chat so that... Uh, you can uh, you can see what people are writing. Are there any other questions, or shall shall we uh, say a few words about the next meeting at this point? I Let would me just like say, to... oh, sorry. Let yeah. me just say, if there are any questions or anything, I mean, feel free to email me and I'll answer anything that if, you, if there's anything that that you would like to know about the Nazis. Back to you, Magda. Sorry. I just wanted to make one correction. Mike said, thank you, Magda, etc., meaning both of us, because <laughs> Monica is just as much responsible for everything that is happening uh, as I am, as all of you actually are. So that was just, just a correction on my part. So is Gunti, because she is also, you know, uh, in charge and helping us with uh, uh, the series. So she is as much a guest speaker today as she is 
uh, the host, <laughs> uh, a special host today. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, let me, uh, if there are no questions at this point, um, uh, again, as Gundi said a moment ago, you can send uh, questions to her directly by email. Uh, you can contact us and we will pass them to her if you if you wish, uh, that is also uh, an option. So let me share my screen at this point with you uh, to show you uh, that uh, our next meeting is going uh, to take place in uh, April, on the 27th of April, and our speaker at that time will be Yuri Desprenta from the University of Kent. He will be talking about the oldest Middle Dutch translations of the Psalms. So as you can see, we are jumping to and fro. Last time we were talking about uh, Middle English um, uh, prayers, uh, connected with the, the, the Psalms and, and the Psalter. Uh, today, as we said last time, uh, we are back um, to the roots, to the beginnings. And uh, uh, in April, we are moving on to uh, uh, Middle Dutch translations. Um, so I hope you can all join us in April. Uh, and I hope we won't have this uh, problem with uh, time discrepancy then. So thank you very much for your patience and uh, for being with us here today. Just um, um, on a different note, uh, before we, we all leave the meeting, before we uh, say goodbye to one another uh, for a month, uh, let me just uh, share something with you. Earlier today, I got uh, a letter from uh, Gudrun Wolf from Germany with an obituary uh, for uh, Helmut Gneus, and I'm sure Many of you know him. He passed away on the 26th of February, and I, I've just learned about this. And I'm talking about him and telling you about this because he is uh, uh, rather indirectly, and I, 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 I don't think he ever knew about it, but he's uh, responsible for uh, the fact that the series uh, were brought into being. Uh, when I started corresponding with him during the pandemic about a, a certain sort of discovery, uh, that is how the idea of, uh, you know, setting up a series of meetings concerned with uh, Psalms and Psalters uh, came about. So I just wanted to share with you this uh, uh, news that I got uh, earlier today. And perhaps uh, we might think Magda of, you know, dedicating the uh, volume to his memory. But that's a topic for another conversation, perhaps. Thank you. Uh, again uh, for a wonderful talk and um, uh, well uh, until next time until the 27th of april thank you thank you thank you is gunti gone already uh she said she had some other arrangements so perhaps that's why there was a there was a fire drill during a talk. Was there? Oh. Yes. Yes, there, there was. Uh, um, Grania wrote me about it, but Gundi went on uninterrupted as it was going on. And Grania asked whether I could hear that, whether we could hear that. But we I could. didn't. So <laughs> she was, you know, she was exposed to all sorts of calamities today. Oh, yeah. But she did great. I mean, you know, she she was so enthusiastic, she, all, all wrapped in, you know, the topic. So I, I she didn't pay attention probably to the background noise. <laughs> background noise. Yes, fire <laughs> drills in Notre Dame. Kind of hard to ignore, I'd say. Uh, it's hard to ignore every, everywhere. Yes, but not when Augustine is speaking. No. Perhaps that's the reason. Yes. Okay. <sighs> Magda, shall we uh... close the meeting? I think. Yes. Yes, I didn't know about Helmut. I'm sorry. No, really. Yeah. Me too. That was that was a good idea of dedicating the volume to him. I didn't want to respond immediately because oh, no. I mean, it's kind of obvious what you said is a it's a good idea. So. But yeah. I just felt, you know, yes. like I had to share it. That was a spontaneous moment, which I think will follow on. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, then, and see you in a month's time.
Thank you. Bye-bye.